Conservation Network and um, is working in communities both in Hawaii and throughout and across the Indo-Pacific to help these communities achieve their natural resources objectives. Yep. Aloha kako. First I just wanted to convey what an honor it is to be here to talk with you about this subject because um, more than anything, I want to convey that there are many other organizations here in Hawaii that are working in community-based marine resources management. And more importantly, there are many dozens of communities who are working to care for their marine resources. And just the nature of things in Hawaii is most of those folks are working during the day, regular business hours, and then go home and put on a different hat and become stewards for their community resources. So they're, they're doing many different jobs, and so they couldn't be here to present on this subject. So um, again, I'm honored and flattered that Athleen asked us from CCN to present uh, at this plenary. Um, just want to emphasize also, CCN works only in communities where we're invited to work. So. The, the programs that I'm going to share with you and any results from those programs um, are actually the successes of the communities themselves. We're a facilitative organization. We provide technical assistance, but we don't, we're not the ones on the ground doing the work. So um, again, all the programs and any uh, results that are achieved are, are the communities. So why are organizations, communities, and state agencies, and even federal agencies getting so interested in community-based management? Um, obviously, for millennia, communities have managed their own resources. But it's just been in about the last decade that there's been kind of a, an awareness or a push of how successful these efforts have been. And so if you look at every continent around the, around the world, there are really significant examples of community-based resources management occurring, and so there are just a few examples here, but that's one reason people are moving this direction. Also, it makes sense, doesn't it? Communities are usually the first ones to understand what the stresses are on the environment. They're the first ones to notice a decline in a fishery, for example. So here are examples of actual quotes I've heard at community meetings where people are, are expressing their concern over the condition and the changes to ocean resources in Hawaii. And then there has been a system in place here in Hawaii for many, 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 many generations where people were managing a, in a community-based way. It was a community kuleana or responsibility to care for their place. Limuhuli Garden of the National Tropical Botanical Gardens on Kauai created this poster to represent what a Mahupua'a system of resources management used to look like. And um, the title of this presentation is Looking Forward to the Past, because I know in the communities that CCN works with, when we ask people what they want, what their vision is for the future, they actually look back. And they look at a, at a, at a system like the Ahupua'a management system, where the community cares for a place and there's integration between land and sea management. And so um, community-based management is, is proven to work here in Hawaii, even for a population of Hawaiians that existed before contact times with Western, Western contact. Um, so that's another reason why it's, uh, people are interested in bringing back the lessons that have, were learned from the past. So once you, once you decide you're going to embrace community-based management, it's not, uh, it's not just a method of going to a community. There are, there are many different processes involved that don't necessarily work when you're working from a, a more um, 
autocratic, authoritarian, or top-down perspective. So every organization or every community that engages in resources management is going to have different processes. I can just talk to you from my experience at the Community Conservation Network and the communities that we work with. So that's the processes I'm going to highlight. Um, very important, right, when you're doing community-based management to start with the community. So the community usually would come to us and express some concern that they have generally about a decline in the resources. And so from there, it's just one-on-one -on -one conversations with stakeholders. And here in Hawaii, it's really important to start with your kupuna in the community because they have the long-term perspective. They're bringing forward things that they've learned from their elders as well. So the, you know, the, the time range becomes quite large in terms of the knowledge that's being gathered from the kupuna. And, um, and that was one of the things I liked about Bill Walsh's presentation is the, the kupuna comments on enforcement even. Um, are important. So other stakeholders, but especially the kapuna, beginning conversations there. And then going into community organizing. So, you know, in any community, people are very busy, but there's often some consensus around particular issues that are of concern and ideas about where to go from there. So it involves a lot of community organizing and it can, involves consensus building. Um, CCN likes to engage in the process of what we call conceptual modeling. It can be called strategic planning, SWOT analysis. There are a lot of different names for it, a lot of different approaches. But it's a way to engage the community so that they can collectively identify what their vision is for the resources in their area, what the goals, objectives, what's threatening their goals and objectives now, um, and the opportunities and resources that are available to them as well. This is also a really wonderful time to bring in you know, do background research about the science that's been done in an area. What, where are the pukas? What, what information is still needed to help you really achieve your resource management goals? Um, what kind of social conditions? What are the political realities of that place? So there's, this is a, a, a lot of information gathering going on at this, at this time. Then taking that information and actually moving into developing a management plan for the resources. And again, science is critical to this piece as well, because if you, if you don't have the understanding of the scientific realities of the place, how can you manage for that? Um, that moves into, you know, you've got your goals, you've got your objectives, and what are you actually going to do in the ground to implement? So strategies, activities, who's going to do what, by when. And the management plan, the work planning, always needs to include monitoring and evaluation as well, because how else do you know whether you're getting to the long-term vision, your goals and objectives, if you're not doing monitoring and evaluation? So that's a very quick and dirty rundown of a, of a process that we utilize when we work with communities. Another primary process is networking. And this, um, this is done all around the world, again. One of the, one of the most talked about examples is the locally managed marine area network, which is a network of Indo-Pacific communities, kind of started in Fiji and exploded from there. And Uncle Mac Poipoi from Molokai suggested uh, several years ago that there'd be a similar network in Hawaii where practitioners and communities would come together, share their lessons with one another, and therefore be able to come up with better strategies, to come up with better ideas, and to just share um, with each other to improve their practice, their management practice on the ground. So in 2003, Hulu Malama Omo'omomi, the Nature Conservancy, and the Community Conservation Network helped to convene this an, an, a group of folks to come together. I'll also say, I know that there are other networks of practitioners in Hawaii, um, again, I, I can only talk about my experience, and this is the group that I have experience with. So this does not preclude th that there are other groups. Um, this particular network is a, a group of coastal communities from around the state, and they're working to manage nearshore marine resources in the areas where they live. In 2003, there were about 12 communities that participated. At the last workshop we held in February, um, there were 20. So it, it has grown. The idea is to learn from each other. Um, how to improve their practices, and it's done through workshops, uh, regular meetings, and exchange visits. Back in 2003, the network identified what their top priorities were, and I think you'll see some of them um, have been reflected in the, in the previous two discussions as well. One of their top priorities was actually to link the kupuna and the opio in communities so that the knowledge that the, that the elders have is not lost, and it's a way to engage youth 
in community management because they see that the youth are going to be the ones that help to manage the resources in the future. The second top priority was direct involvement of communities in marine resources management. Um, again, going back to that slide that showed the beautiful poster that Lima Hooli Gardens created, there was a history of community-based management here. Um, more than direct involvement, they had the sole involvement in managing their marine resources and the state um, the state system had given them a back seat and they wanted to be more, more in the, around the table in the conversation again about how to manage resources. So some of the projects that came out of that, um, one was a traditional knowledge project where children and elders would get together and um, the children would learn directly about practices in marine resources management that were utilized in the past. And here you, you can see Uncle Walter Paolo from Milovii on the Big Island teaching a child about Apollo fishing. And here's another example of that project in Milovii. Also, one of the, one of the primary tools that um, folks are using in these communities is fishing practices and other resource management practices according to the Hawaiian moon calendar. So they would associate spawning cycles, for example, with tides and with the moon phase, and then manage accordingly. So this is another tool that's being used to help manage resources today. And it's something that was utilized in the past that is being used for the future today. In terms of the direct community involvement, um, the creation of the Mackay Watch program, this was a collaboration between the Department of Land and Natural Resources, between various organizations, nonprofit organizations, and especially community groups to try to establish some, um, some actual things that communities can do on the ground to help manage resources in their areas. And it answers some of the enforcement questions, which I'll get to in just a moment. One of the components is raising awareness of the rules and regulations of particular areas. Sometimes opono practices is if an area doesn't have special, um, it's not a specially designated like marine life conservation district, but the community there has particular practices that are associated with its traditional uses of the area, they might try to educate visitors to that place about those practices and ask for them to comply voluntarily. Also, um, marine ecology, the history, the culture of a place, so that the folks who come to visit can be more respectful of it, and hopefully it will limit their negative impacts, both culturally and environmentally. Biological monitoring is another component. This is where community members actually get into the water and do fish surveys. Generally, um, CCN works with the community just to determine what marine species are important to that community and what species they feel are at most risk. So they're not necessarily doing what the Division of Aquatic Resources does in terms of the monitoring. It's a very different approach to monitoring because they'll limit the number of species, have a smaller list, and focus on those that are important, for example, for their subsistence fishing needs. But the goal is to involve the community, to supplement the information that the scientists at, at uh, DLNR are collecting, and then um, to track sudden changes because the community members are in the water much more regularly than a, a division scientist could be. So there's an example of monitoring at Pupukea, and then there's a child who's doing water quality monitoring on Kauai. This is just an example of some of the data forms that are used. So the, um, you know, the community members will learn the different, um, different species of fish that they're going to monitor, will actually do transects in the water, and then collect the data and manage the data on a community level. Here's just an example of fish results just recently from um, swims at Pupukea. And I just highlighted the, the uhu males at the bottom. Now, obviously in two months, it's too short to see whether there's actually changes in the um, population of uhu males. But we highlighted that because there's a lot of poaching at Pupukea. And one of the primary species that are heavily poached there are the uhu. People come spearfish at night when nobody's around to, to see that they're there. And so we're, we're tracking the uhu male right now to see if somebody came and pounded it at some point and, and all those uhus were taken out. We don't know yet, but that's, that's the sudden and precipitous changes that we're looking for um, just to keep, keep us on the alert. Another component is the, is the human use monitoring. And the goal is basically to, to more fully understand what the human uses of the area are so that you can manage them. 
it's fairly straightforward. If you know that there are certain times that all the, all the tourists come, then you can have your, your outreach people there to talk to the tourists at those times. If you know that there are certain times of day where people are, are spearfishing, then you can try to um, establish some enforcement around those times. So it's just getting the information so that you can then manage accordingly. This is just an example of a, a human use data sheet. Again, sit down with the community, talk about the uses that they're already aware of in the place, and they track those uses, and they come up with the, the charts and graphs to, to display the answers. And the final component um, goes back to the community-based enforcement piece, observation and compliance. The Mackay Watch program was modeled after the National Neighborhood Watch program, where the idea is that the community members are the eyes and the ears for that place. They live there they see what's really happening. So they can learn about the particular regulations or rules for an area, and they can become familiar and get to know their doe care officers. They can get familiar with what kind of reports or information might be needed if they see something happening and they want to report it, and a doe care officer isn't available because they're working on all those other things. Um, they can actually take the information that they need and present that to doe care. So right now there are several communities that are engaged in the Kai Watch programs. Um, again, there are more than what I have listed here, but um, CCN works closely or partners with the Nature Conservancy and with the Hawaii Wildlife Fund. So through CCN, TNC, and HWF, these are some of the communities that are currently involved in the Kai Watch. Communities also have started getting engaged in policy work because they recognize that sometimes the policies are broken and contributing to the problems. So I just wanted to mention that as that's a component of community-based marine resources management. Um, the Division of Aquatic Resources created this wonderful guidebook to community activities to help coastal communities care for their resources. And there are a couple of copies I understand here at the conference, but you can also download it from CCN's website. So the address is listed there at the, at the bottom bullet. So www.conservationpractice.org. It's all one word. Um, that guidebook goes through the different Mackay Watch activities I just talked about, the traditional knowledge activities, but it goes beyond that too. It talks about alien algae, boat moorings, and some other activities that communities can get involved with. So lessons learned, um, again, these are just very broad overview lessons that we've learned over the past few years of working in Hawaii. Um, as I mentioned before, we start with a core group of community members. I also just want to point out, this is a picture of the Heiia fish pond, and the contraption there is something that was created by the Nature Conservancy that helps to take alien algae out of an environment with, uh, with human help, obviously, but that's what that contraption is in the water. Anyway, we start with a core group of community members um, because usually there are at least a handful. And holistic approaches, um, just fine when you work with communities, there are all these other issues that come up. So being able to look at something not just in a box and say, no, we're just going to deal with your fish, but we're going to look at the whole picture has been important. So I thank you very much. Again, honored to be here and um, hope that you really understand that this is an exciting direction that communities are doing. Thanks. <laughs> Hakali da ohu leva ia e kalawa e haka ano oleke ia ohu no ke no ke hakala la ke ia manu ika ohu ika ohi ahama me ho ahama ida le o kale huapa ne apa ne mai pahai ke ia mamu e.